Adrian, I have to warn you, you know, this is the most challenging slot in a conference. They're an angry crowd, right? No, we call it the graveyard <laughs> slot because it's after lunch and everybody <laughs> tends to fall asleep. <laughs> like three weeks ago, I moderated the panel in this time and a guy at the first row fall as fell asleep. So I told the guy next to him, can you please wake him up? He looked at me and he said, you made him sleep, you wake him up. <laughs> okay, so you have to be smart, witty, funny, serious, engaging, and all of it together. And we have 20 minutes, which I took already five. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I have the pleasure to introduce to you Adrian Monk. Adrian was one of the leading players in the annual Davos, Davos, what I call it, conference, extravaganza. Carnival. Carnival. Carousel. Carousel. And among other things, he managed the media, the media crowd. He had relations with how many leading, leading uh, journalists, editors, publishers, etc.? 250 of the world's assorted journalists, editors, columnists, writers. Yeah, how enjoyable Freeloaders. was this assignment? How, how do, it's, it's, you know, this is 250 of uh, people who probably think they are the most important people in the world. And they are right. And some of them are right, yeah, you know. Some of them are. Each one is the most important. For themselves, yeah. Which defy mathematics, you know, but... Exactly. And you poor guy had to satisfy them. Well, you know, it's like, you know, you're the chum and they're the sharks. And, you know, you have to break a bit of yourself off and throw it in. And, you know, you always come out with one arm less or one leg less than you went in. But that's the way the... And everybody is competing to get the scoop with all the other 250. Everybody is everybody wants, you know, that something that somebody said, that moment that was unguarded, you know, uh, that was just in, in the UK, there was this minister who said something off camera and it was a big story. Well, every, every single moment in Davos, you know, you've got your, the urinal if you're a guy and you're next to somebody, they're talking to someone, they say something they shouldn't say. You know, I mean, typically, one of my favorite ones, every CEO in the room here is like, they would always drop their next quarterly results in a session, because why wouldn't you? And then they'd come out and they'd say, I, I didn't, uh, you know, I shouldn't have said that. So can you have them unreported? <laughs> I'd be like, well, the Reuters wire went out about 15 minutes ago, so it's gonna be difficult to take that back. So you came from the university to this uh, shark pool. Yeah. Tell us, just you know, for illustration, what was the your first day in this new environment? So my first day on the job, you know, I'd been a university professor. Before that, I was a TV exec, and I started life as a war correspondent. Probably the war correspondent bit was the most relevant. And uh, so tragedy, comedy, drama, right? One day, first day on the job. Get into the office, five o'clock. Head of our security detail is looking, you know, miserable. So I said, well, cheer up. And he said, why? And I said, well, come on, you know, day one, big start. He says, well, the head of police just shot himself in his bedroom. I was like, okay, that's serious. Gonna have to deal with that. Spent the next morning, few hours, dealing with the aftermath of a horrible tragedy that happened right on our doorstep. Come lunchtime, feeling a little bit jaded, I have to say. I go down to start greeting all of the luminaries who are coming to Davos, right? You have to go down, they all pick up their stuff, they pick up a booklet with two and a half thousand of their peers no, in, no, no. All, you know, all this stuff, right? So one, uh, the booklet also lists your spouse. One particular unnamed No, uh, I, I said, uh, let, let's, let's, yeah. let's, no, let's skip was, it. Uh, we'll skip that one. Let's anyway, skip this one. It was, we uh, should leave you in some tensions we'll and you will come next year. I can't tell you that one. Anyway, the afternoon after that particular saga, which was this minor career-ending drama, I should say, I'm sitting in the, about four o'clock in the hall, a foreign minister of a country that is a global pariah decides he's gonna hold a press conference to decry everything that's been going on in the main hall with some other non-global pariah presidents and prime ministers. 
on the stairs in the main part of the building. So he has his guys start summoning everybody in for this press conference. I'm like, this is not a good look, yeah? I mean, not great to have an impromptu press conference by a global pariah in the middle of, you know, what should be talking about something else, right? So I said to uh, the guy, this isn't a great place. We can do it somewhere better. So I took him to this bunker. We have a nuclear bunker in, in every public building in Switzerland. There's one in the Davos Conference Center. Took him down, let him in, threw all these little things, put him in a room. I said, give him as much biscuits and tea as you want. We kept him there with endless tea and biscuits for two hours till they finally emptied the Congress Center out. And then I said, you can do your press conference now. <laughs> this is the kind of silly, stupid way that you solve, obviously, international diplomatic incidents, basically with bourbon biscuits, rich tea, and uh, a little bit of afternoon Earl Grey. But it's, you know, it's some examples of how crazy, silly, and ridiculous the kind of world that yeah, Unfortunately, we, have we don't have as much time as we need to elaborate on it before we go to some serious well, the fair, I want to ask a question which I'm always asked. If you are not registered to the main event in Davos and you want to get a sleeping place in the city while Davos goes on, what are your best chances? Best of, I always say, recommend you know, a sleeping bag and platform three at Zurich uh, railway station. Is, is my favorite go-to place, you know. It's two hours. It can be a little chilly in January, but you know, if you're relatively hardy, uh, you can make it up to town and then go back. And the police will move you on around 2 a.m., but as long as you can kind of keep walking until six, <laughs> it'll be fine. Okay, we got the idea. Now, Adrian, I want to ask you something. You watch, you watch the, the world scene, you know, a great, a great platform to watch the, what's going on in the world for the last uh, 14 years in Davos and before. At the 90s, what was when this uh, chain, uh, Japanese guy wrote the end of history? Uh, the end of history, Francis Fukuyama. Yeah, yeah. what, 1990s yeah. something. We thought the world is coming to a wonderful situation uh, liberalism is ruling. China comes into WCO, uh, more and more China democracies China become in part the world. of the group. Russia became a, yeah. a kind of a normal country, so to say. And we can, we can rest on the political uh, laurels. And then for the last, what, 10, 15 years, we see the whole thing kind of deteriorating more dictatorships are showing up. Uh, things, um, countries become again more isolated. Global collaboration reduced wars in, I think, 26 different places around uh, the world, not to mention only Ukraine, etc. Do you, can you make a hypothesis why we got this change, you know, from the, from the Rory's 90s, if you want, Roaring mm -hmm. the 90s to the, to the depressing 2000s? I mean, you got a financial crisis in 2008, but I think in terms of the point about democracies, autocracies, is a really important point, and I think it's a point that we don't take seriously in Europe, we don't take seriously on this continent, and that is, and I don't think in the US they take it seriously either, which is the digital space has transformed the public sphere. You know, your great, good old Jürgen Habermas, you know, he was right when he was talking about the concept of a public sphere. There is one, there ought to be one. Now, in the good old days of maybe 30 years ago that you were talking about, You'd have a Süddeutsche Zeitung, you'd have a Handelsblatt, you'd have ZDF, you'd have ARD. All of those institutions, to some extent, regulated by tradition, by professional values, by regulators in the case of state broadcasting, okay? Digital media came in and blew that away. It blew the business model away, it blew the values away, it blew the professional values away, and it blew a lot of the regulation away. And what it allowed were other entrants to come in to this 
market, which is a market of ideas, basically, about politics and about what we all think, and it allowed those entrants to create mischief. And you saw it with Russia Today, for example, broadcasting across Europe. You've seen it with other broadcasters. You know, Iran has one. Other countries have them. And you've also seen it in the funding of Sam Is That website. So there are websites that are very popular. You know, Zero Hedge. You know, that's a website that we know is not necessarily sending out stuff that's too different from what the Kremlin thinks. All of this stuff is available online. All of this stuff is coming in to basically corrupt the public sphere in democracies. And we're not ready for it. We don't know what we're doing when we think about it. And we're not willing to have the conversation about it. Sorry if I get off my soapbox at this point and stop being no, a no, professor. No, very, very important. So uh, wh what, is, what is the remedy? Is there a remedy or a distinct to see the world becoming more and more uh, autocratic and deteriorating? Well, you know, we can't, we can't necessarily go into other countries and change their political systems, but we damn well can protect our own. And I think we s need to start having the conversation in our own societies about what it means to have that kind of protection. Because if we don't, we're going to find ourselves in exactly the position that other countries have found, where you've got interference from third parties, you've got other people putting money in to do things and change conversations or stop conversations being had. And that, I think, is very, very disruptive in democracies. But when well, you, had, you had the chance to talk to these opinion shapers, you know, the new media as well as the old media, mm. or the old media, you know, the Salzburgers, the... The, the leaders of the printed, the mm. traditional printed press, what was the traditional printed press, and to the Zuckerbergs and the, to the Google guys, etc. you spoke with them. And I guess that this subject would have, w was raised here and then. What, so, so what was their reaction? You know, we tried to have that conversation. We tried to have that conversation. You could have that conversation with traditional broadcasters, with mainstream media. You could have that conversation with new digital entrants. You could not have that conversation with platforms. And I think that ha not having that conversation was a tragedy because it needed to be had and the protections needed to be put in place. You know, in Europe, we've had pretty good protection for speech for a long time. We're used to it. You know, you can't shout fire in the movie theater. There are certain things we know, if you say, are going to corrupt public conversation. We know that. We don't let people say them for good reason. Now, to bring in a f sort of American Wild West standard of speech, which might have worked in a kind of saloon bar in Arkansas in 1930, to Europe, that has been an unmitigated disaster, I think. And, you know, I'd love it if people wanted to start talking more about it, because, you know, at the moment, we just get on and ignore it and take it as a part of, you know, the digital environment that we live in. It doesn't have to be like that. Okay, we should, as I say, time is very short. We should have elaborated more on it, but we don't have the time. Let, let me move to maybe the last topic. And, you know, this day is of AI. And uh, there are a lot of talk already for a few years about AI replacing journalists, etc. What is your view about the future of AI and the future of journalism in the forthcoming media scene? So very, I'll be very quick. I'm advising a university in the UAE right now, which is devoted to AI. And it's a fascinating sort of learning journey, seeing what they're doing with it. Personally, I think you know, we have to change the way we do journalism. Because if we just expect AI to be a little handy helper sitting over our shoulders doing journalism, we're going to fail to realize the gains. AI is going to change every single job, every single workflow. The thing that will resist it most are professions, licensing, and people who have nice enough jobs that they can, a little bit like Martin when he was joking, say that you know, they'll keep AI at arm's length. I'm just going to, very last thought for you, right? Go back to just before World War I. There were cavalry regiments. They brought cavalry to World War I. You know, if you watch some of those movies, War Horse, great movie, 
you'll see them bringing all these horses up to face machine guns. Now, these people are smart, you know, they're generals, they're strategists, they're tacticians. They brought these animals up to be killed because they like riding horses and they didn't want anyone to stop them. Now, that's the army for you who actually have to do things like fight wars where people die. If you think about us and our professions, what are we going to do to reorganize what we do and reshape what we do and how much change are we going to take on board in order to take advantage of this revolution that's coming? Because it's coming. And you, know, you can either play, take a place of saying, I'd like it as a nice little thing on the side, or you can say, bring it on, let's, ha let's have the change. And what, how do you see your own, your personal role in this grand scheme of things in the future? <laughs> well, uh, you know, because like I don't know if I mentioned that Adrian just left the WEF and is now contemplating should I also solicit offerings to you yeah, from yeah, well, the Yeah, please do. I'll leave my copies of my open for work yeah. uh, uh, resume around. But I think there's a huge opportunity to create new ways of delivering inf smart information using artificial intelligence. I write a newsletter every week. It goes to 165,000 people on LinkedIn. It takes me four hours to do. I use a lot of AI to kind of research it, prep it. Every day you are doing it? Every week. Every, Every week. week I do it, yeah. There's only one of me, look. You know, I'm not, a, I'm not cloning myself. Yeah. I haven't got there yet. Um, but I think AI is offering this incredible workflow ch step change for journalism. And for people who want to embrace it, and to me, that's any age. You know, I've worked with digital mavericks who are 25, and digital mavericks are 65, 75, and, you know, even your age, Yossi. I mean, really, that old. I'm very old, you know. <laughs> I'm, but, about, um, I'm about to disappear very soon. <laughs> but it's, uh, you know, it's an incredible moment right now. And I think, you know, to seize it doesn't mean to add it to what we've got. It means to create something new. And okay, that's what and we will in. wrap it up by asking you to tell us two sentences. One, what was your main takeaway from the last 14 years? What is the thing you learned or... The main thing, I think, when I was a journalist, you know, covering wars and covering conflicts and covering politics, I always assumed that every single world leader was on a kind of group WhatsApp or, you know, back then a kind of speed dial, you know, they all talk to each other. And when you actually go in and deal with all of these folks, you realize that actually, my God, it's a scary, fragmented world out there. And the fact that it actually kind of moves along in the way we all think is an incredible tribute to our, um, I don't know, what I'd say is an incredible tribute to you, but you know, the fact is, it ain't, it ain't as smooth as it all looks. And it's amazing that some of it works in the way it works. And, and, the, last, and the last thing, uh, in the crowd there are a few people which are younger than you. <laughs> Give them a good advice for That's life. Good. <laughs> good advice for life? Well, you know, keep, keep being enthusiastic. I mean, if you lose your enthusiasm and your curiosity, you might as well, you know, nip into the graveyard on your way home and bury yourself. So stay curious. <laughs> Burying. Adrian, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm just sorry we don't have another half an hour, but we will continue it in January. God wants. Be well. Thank you. <laughs>